meant National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration folks. And I mean, it was clear that, I mean, this was a huge spill. And how were we going to get our voice out um, and what mattered to us, which were the fish coming back? You're a marine toxicologist. Explain the extent of the devastation. Uh, marine toxicology is a study of pollution, marine pollution. And the fishermen went, okay, here come all these scientists and experts, and we have Ricky. And I'm like, oh, man. Um, it, we were worried that the oil, the killing would not stop in 1989. Um, the scientists, it was a huge devastation. I couldn't even go out on the beaches initially. I couldn't take the emotional hit. Um, people came back, the fishermen, and they said they had sat down on what they presumed was rock to cry, and it turned out to be like an oiled sea otter or something that was dying. Um, there were just bodies everywhere. Um, the oil in some of the bays was over three feet thick. You couldn't even hear the sound of the waves crashing on the shoreline. Everything was muted. Some of the oil with the storm that came through, there was a huge storm that came through, and it just smeared oil up to 40 feet high on some of our coastline. It was in the trees. I mean, it just took animals out, and it was very, very quiet. How many animals died? Uh, there was up to half a million seabirds, up to 5,000 sea otters, uh, 300 or so harbor seals, billions of young salmon and herring fish eggs, and young juvenile fish. And this was a problem because it created a delayed impact. I mean, when you take out eggs, you don't really see the impact until those eggs should have become adults and joined the adult population. That's what we saw with herring. The crash didn't happen until 1993, four years later, when the young of the year in 89 failed to materialize. And so what happened to the herring industry? How extensive was it? Well, the salmon and the herring both collapsed because they were spawned on these beaches, these oiled beaches. Salmon, and this was 92, 93. This is delayed, delayed harm. Salmon gradually came back, but herring never did. And this is a huge problem, not only for the ecosystem, but also for the economy. Um, herring are the main forage fish of the ecosystem of Prince William Sound. So whales, sea lions, seabirds, everything depends on herring. Um, without herring, realistically, we can't expect the sound to recover. And what the scientists are saying now is they have no idea how long it will take for herring to recover. Meanwhile, the herring fisheries are closed indefinitely, indefinitely. So the permits that we pay a limited uh, price for a limited entry permit. It's kind of like buying a home. It's a, a big price, um, and you take out a debt, a loan, and then you pay it back every year based on your fishing income. And zero, it's zero income for herring fishermen. So they have incurred a huge debt um, on, on this permit. And it's really the debt that's, that's eating us alive now, um, $300,000. And these permits are worth now about $15,000? I mean... The mayor committed suicide? One of our mayors, right after the spill, uh, he did. And it was 1993 when the fish runs were collapsing. And it, I literally, I call that year as bad as it gets. Um, up to that point, we had been victims. Um, we had been waiting for Exxon to pay us. Exxon promised to make us whole. You know, you're lucky you have Exxon. Um, we hadn't even gone to court by 1993. We had fish run collapses, bankruptcies, divorces, suicides, you know, domestic violence spikes, um, substance abuse spikes. The town was just unraveling. And we were waiting for somebody to help us. The state of Alaska, the federal government, the court system, Exxon, nobody. And um, there were 33,000 plaintiffs. There are 32,000 claims, 22,000 plaintiffs. Some people had multiple fishing permits, so salmon fishing, herring fishing, so they would have two claims. And um, th these are people all through uh, 22 communities and even as far out as Bristol Bay because it, the effect, uh, the price dropped and there was a price tainting effect. So um, what, what we did was um, the mayor in our dark hour, it really was our darkest hour, um, committed suicide. And what we did after the fish run collapse is we did a community-wide act of civil disobedience. We blockaded Valdez Narrows held up oil tanker traffic. This was to bring attention to Prince William Sound. 
everything was collapsing, seabirds, marine mammals, fish. And this got the attention of President Clinton, and he said, what is it that you fishermen want? And we said, we don't want to be fined for civil disobedience, we're desperate, and also we want ecosystem studies. We want the scientists to connect the dots between the seabirds, the marine mammals, the fish, the beaches. What happened to Prince William Sound? Those ecosystem studies began in 1994, really too late for our trial. They didn't get completed until about 2004. I'm talking about published papers now. And those studies show, sure enough, the oil that's remaining on our beaches is still Let causing Let me see. You have harm. brought a little jar. This is uh, Exxon Valdez Oil, Smith Island, Prince William Sound. This is one year ago. This, this is, is not July from 2nd to last year, not even a year. This is astounding. That's what we think, too. I take children out on the beaches now who were born after the spill and say, this is your legacy. It's just covered in oil. The, it, the oil specifically is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs. This is actually coming out the tailpipes of our automobiles. It's the fine soot. That's kind of the code word for it. Um, and this is linked with genetic harm, not only in animals, but in people as well. Respiratory harm, reproductive impairment, cancers. Um, very low levels of these, this oil, these PAHs, cause incredible harm. You've people. said that this is not just an environmental disaster, but a crisis in democracy. It, it, it is a democracy crisis. The question we started asking as our lawsuit went on and on and on, and we did get paid, was how did corporations get this big, where they can manipulate the legal system, the political system? What happened here? And I thought that was a really good question, so I went to answer it. And that became the final chapter of Not One Drop. And I learned from other people's work that, um, our, that there's actually two ways to amend the Constitution. One is formally through people-made law, which we've done 27 times, and one is informally through what Thomas Jefferson called the engine of consolidation, the federal judiciary, the Supreme Court. And in 1886, the Supreme Court made sort of a seminal decision where it granted a railroad corporation uh, equal protection under the 14th Amendment, which is, of course, the uh, Civil Rights Amendment for due process and equal protection for African American men. For the first 40 years after that passed, there were 307 lawsuits brought. Um, 19 by African American men, the rest by corporations. And at that point, when the 14th Amendment passed to corporations, this thing called a corporate person arose. And that corporate person, in the eyes of the law, is able to uh, access our rights, human rights, the Bill of Rights, constitutional protections. This is wrong. The word corporation never appears in the, the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. This is how we've lost freedom of speech. We still, we as people still have the First Amendment, but so do corporations. Free speech equals money. Those with more money have more speech. Pretty simple. So I began to understand that the legal system is broken. The election process is broken, all because of the same reason, this corporate personhood. Where has Sarah Palin, the governor, stood on the Exxon case? She has, um, she has never seen an oiled beach. She's been protected from that. She stood with the fishermen at the Supreme Court. Um, uh, we had a hearing. Um, and talked, but it's easy to stand with people. It's a whole other thing to stand against the corporations, and we haven't seen that. We haven't seen her claiming, asking Exxon, for example, to pay $92 million outstanding to clean up that oil that's still on our beaches. 1994, the jury rules you get $5 billion. What the, happened? The jury, it took three weeks to come up with that decision. They didn't just pull it out of the air. The jury asked the question, how do we hold a corporation this large accountable to people? And the jury decided they had to tie profit to punishment. So at the time, 1994, that was one year's net profit for Exxon, $5 billion. And that, that way you can hold, you know, big corporation, big punishment. What the Supreme Court did was, they severed that link, and they instead linked profit to damages. Well, there's a problem. We are still incurring ongoing damages in Prince William Sound, because we're not fishing herring, for example. So we didn't get all of our damages. Meanwhile, this one-to-one -one ratio of punitive to damages sets 
is a problem now for everybody in America. We all lost our ability to hold big corporations accountable. This was the threat of unlimited liability. Just the mere threat held these corporations accountable to consumer safety laws, public health laws, environmental protection laws. We've lost that now. What we need is Congress to, what I call, overturn this by taking up the issue of punitive damages and asking the question, how do we hold these large corporations accountable? What have what kind of relief have you gotten at this point, Rekiat? What has have your communities gotten? What has ExxonMobil paid out? We have gotten ten cents on the dollar. Most of my friends have been able to claim uh, to receive seven to ten percent of what they were have actually lost at this point in time, twenty years later. I even have some friends whose individual share of that punitive damage award um, is not it's less than what they will have to pay their bankruptcy lawyer. Are you concerned about another spill 20 years later? I am 